Now I'd like to introduce our wonderful speaker, Marianne. Marianne Borges is a naturalist, writer, photographer, and educator. She is the editor of Butterfly Gardener Magazine, a publication of the North American Butterfly Association. She's an instructor and naturalist at Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve in New Hope, Pennsylvania. She's a Pennsylvania master naturalist and the team leader for Lambertville Goes Wild on Weebly.com. Her photographs have been featured in numerous publications. She shares her love of nature through her writing and photography at thenaturalweb.org. Now for Marianne. Thank you, Beverly. Well, you've already uh, actually answered the question. The natural web, who needs plants? Well, it's pretty much everybody. So let's take a look at um, Basically, plants are the foundation for our existence and the existence of almost all other living beings on the planet. There's a small group of um, organisms that live in the ocean that can produce their own energy. But aside from those, Every other organism on the planet requires plants. First and foremost, they produce oxygen. Um, we couldn't exist if we couldn't breathe. Um, they sequester carbon. They help remove the uh, excess carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to help keep the, the environment cleaner for us and, and uh, reduce temperatures. Um, they do all kinds of things for stormwater management. They help to stabilize the soil, prevent erosion. Um, they help to recharge the groundwater for everybody who's got a well. If the water isn't getting back into the ground, your well is going to run dry. Plants help enable that to occur. Otherwise, without plants, we wouldn't have water for our wells. Um, the water is also cleansed or filtrated. Um, before it goes back into the ground by, with the assistance of the plants. Um, plants help to mitigate flooding. They help to uh, you know, prevent the possibility of flooding. They recycle nutrients. Their habitat for all kinds of animals, including people. So they provide food and habitat for animals. They provide food, medicine, and building material for even humans. And even dead plants play a role. So we'll take a look and see uh, how these things happen. Um, we're going to take a look at plants, not just in relationship to animals, but first we're going to take a look, look at plants in relationship to their physical surroundings, um, what their relationship is to other plants, um, plants and fungi, and then plants and animals. And we're going to look at people and other species of animals. But let's never forget that we're among those animals. Um, the first and most basic thing, plants and their physical surroundings. Plants are the only um, entities, the only organisms who are able to produce their own food. And they do this strictly with the assistance of the energy that the sun provides and the carbon dioxide that they remove from the atmosphere. Um, through photosynthesis, the chemicals um, are reorganized to produce oxygen, which enables us and every other living being on the planet just about um, to be able to exist. We need to be able to breathe oxygen. Um, and plants also produce carbohydrates, which are the basis for food for all organisms on the planet. Um, the only other thing that they need as input to this process is water and minerals that they get from the soil. And that they actually get with some assistance from fungi, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But through photosynthesis, plants take what appears to us to be absolutely nothing, energy from the sun, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, little water and minerals from the soil, and produce the oxygen that we need to be able to survive. And food. Having just had dinner, I think that's really important. Um, so photosynthesis is essential for life on Earth. Um, it's the ultimate source of energy for just about every living being, as I said, with the exception of a small group of organisms that live in the ocean and provide food for a small food web there. Other than that, everybody depends on um, plants to produce oxygen and to produce food. We all end up eating food either uh, directly from plants or eat food that there's other animals that have uh, been eating plants. So we're all dependent on plants. Um, 
Plants also help to moderate global temperatures by absorbing that excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Each plant species has evolved to have sort of a special niche. They've evolved to be able to survive and do well in different types of environments. Some have evolved to do well in um, a woodland, for example, maybe a dry woodland. A lot of the sourlands is a dry woodland, for example. So there are many plants that we find here in our region that uh, have evolved to be successful just in this type of environment. Um, lots of shale, some diabase, um, dry, rocky. Their plants have evolved to be successful there. Other plants that have evolved to be successful in an open sunny meadow area and others that are happy when their feet are wet, that they do well and survive in a wetland area. So different species of plants have evolved to be successful in different niches. Um, and in doing that, they also provide habitat in those special niche niches. They help with stormwater management. If we take a look at this photograph, if you look on the path, this is a very slight hill, a very slight slope. And clearly there's been some uh, rainwater issues that have eroded the a nice little trail in the middle of the uh, uh, in the middle of the trail in the middle of the path here. If we look on either side of the trail, there is um, a pretty dense understory in a woodland, and we don't see any erosion there. So it's plants that have enab enabled the soil to uh, remain there where it is. The roots of the plants keep the soil in place. The roots of the plants help to open the soil so that the water can absorb the soil and take it in. And the water is filtrated, it's cleansed by the plants as it's being processed. Um, this also helps with flood control. Let's take a look at a specific example. This is what my front yard used to look like. Um, if I haven't mentioned it, for anybody who knows me, you might have heard this before, but I live in the Sourlands, as many of you might. And uh, however, I live at the very edge of Lambertville. I live in a townhouse development. And um, just to the south of our house is a grove of trees that has grown up quite a bit since uh, this photo was taken. But the trees shaded out the grass um, the grass died pretty much every year by July, and and our home tried repeatedly to uh, get the grass to grow. That was just a losing proposition because grass does not like shade. So we finally got smart and did something different. Um, what we did notice was successful in this area was moss. And we knew that there are plants that like shade and would do well in shade. So um, we got permission to make a change. I also wanted to show you just how lovely it was when it rained. So when it rained, the water would pool and take quite a while to actually be absorbed by the soil. And it was um, basically a muddy mess. So we realized there was a better way to go with this. And we got permission to plant uh, native woodland understory plants, lots of different species, several ferns, there's Christmas fern, there's lady fern, maidenhair fern, um, foam flower, ragwort, um, many different plants and shrubs um, that we planted. And since then, we don't, we rarely have a problem with uh, the, um, with stormwater. Uh, and, and we've got a lovely garden to look at too. Now, I like to think that that helps not just me and my husband, but everybody who lives downhill from us. We're at almost the highest level of Lambertville, where our home is. We live up here, and the elevation here is about 300 feet. The elevation at the Delaware River, just down below us, is about 50 feet. And if there's storm water that doesn't get absorbed here up on the hill, it can do one of two things. It can just cascade down the streets and cause um, flash flooding down below, or if it goes into the storm sewers, the storm sewers up here drain into Swan Creek, which goes into the Delaware. So we have the potential to contribute to flooding if stormwater is not captured up here on the hillside. So I think that everything that each one of us does affects our whole community. 
So this is kind of an important thing to do. Um, something I didn't realize until a few years ago was that although Lambertville is a city and it's pretty densely populated, um, just below me, um, I live in this townhouse development up here, just below us on the hillside, there are many single family homes that actually have their own wells. So another issue is if that stormwater is not captured and allowed to go back into the ground on the hillside, those wells could end up having an issue. They might end up going dry. So what each and every one of us does makes a difference for all of our neighbors. Um, and how did we make a change? We, we made the difference with plants. They're actually recognized as being part of the, the climate change solution. Um, there are many studies that show that uh, global temperatures can be moderated by the absorption of carbon dioxide um, if we have more trees, more plants. Um, the European Union is currently targeting to preserve about 30% of their natural areas to help ensure that uh, biodiversity doesn't get any worse than it is. Um, you, many of you may have heard that populations of insects have decreased dramatically over the last 50 years, and bird populations have as well. What those creatures need, what those animals need are plants that they have evolved with, plants that are native to the area where they grew up so that they will have enough to eat. There's a lot of specialization that we'll talk about later. So preserving natural areas um, provides habitat for those creatures and ultimately it helps us as well. Um, even in the Paris Climate Accord from 2015, there are provisions for, for preserving forests because of the importance that they, the important role that they play in mitigating climate change. And out west where drought is more of an issue than it is here, not that we never have droughts, but ours so far have tended to be shorter. Um, there are many municipalities or states that um, incent their residents to use native plants instead of having lawns or instead of having some other um, um, exotic ornamentals that would, might require a lot more water. Um, our area is often prone to flooding and we can help to mitigate some of that through judicious use of additional plants to help mitigate that. Plants and fungi, that one little diagram that I showed you of photosynthesis, um, there's sort of a missing piece in it and that is that plants actually partner with fungi. The vast majority of plants partner with mycorrhizal fungi, fungi beneath the ground, um, to, to get the water and minerals that they need. And um, they're actually, uh, it's about 90% that is known of plants that actually require this kind of a partnership. Plants actually also use um, the mycorrhizal fungi. Let me step back for just a minute. So most of us are used to seeing mushrooms and mushrooms are the fruiting body of fungi. But what we might be less familiar with is the fact that this is, is it's sort of the equivalent of the flower in a plant. Um, most of the um, fungi would be underground and many of um, the fungi that are underground, the parts that are underground, will partner with plants. Um, they sort of exchange um, gifts, if you will, or exchange goods. Um, the plants give the fungi food, they give them carbohydrates, and in exchange, the fungi give the plants um, water and minerals. The fungi also act as, as um, part of the, the web of uh, connection among the different plants. The fungi can actually be used for plants to share both food and information with their neighbors. Um, so there's, there's food that may be funneled through the root system to fungi, to other nearby plants. Um, there's also information, there can be chemical signals that are passed through the root system with the assistance of the fungi to other plants. Maybe a chemical signal to say, whoa, I'm being eaten by somebody. We've all got uh, chemical protections we can use to minimize our damage, so ramp it up before they get to you. Um, so it's a partnership. Fungi and plants really need each other. 
Uh, fungi also help to act, there's some species that are specifically evolved to help decompose um, plant material, which ultimately will then return the plant material to the soil and the nutrients there, therein. Um, and as we know, some fungi also are edible, so they're food for us or other animals, and some also have medicinal uses for us or other animals. So they're pretty important, and they, many of them partner with plants. Plants are often thought to compete with each other, um, to compete for sunshine or compete for water or minerals or space. And there is an element of that. Um, there is something called allelopathy. Um, some plants are known to um, exude chemicals perhaps into the soil to make that soil less hospitable to other plants. And one plant that's fairly well known for that is the black walnut. Um, not every other plant species can grow successfully in the vicinity of a black walnut tree under the, say, the, the drip edge of a black walnut tree. And the reason or the, the mechanism that black walnut uses to discourage other plants from growing near it is um, a chemical called juglone, which you may have heard of, but you may not know that juglone is actually an antifungal. So if we just learned that most plants get the food that they need, not directly from the soil, the minerals and water, not directly from the soil, but with the assistance of fungi, and black walnut is um, exuding into the soil a chemical that is an antifungal, then that means that that explains why it's not uh, necessarily a hospitable place for other plants. It's not um, a global antifungal. Some fun, uh, funguses and some, fun, some fungi and some plants are successful uh, living in, in the vicinity of black walnut, but it's just sort of an interesting technique. Um, there are other plants that act as parasites on a parent plant, another plant. Um, beech drops are plants that uh, tap into the roots of parent beech trees or, or beech trees. They get their nutrients from those trees. So uh, you could say it's a competition. You could also say it's sort of a, cooperate, a cooperative relationship as well. And there are a lot of cooperative relationships among plants. Um, the pea family members, for example, are well known that most of them um, release, um, ah, I just lost the word, release, um, I'll think of it in a minute, release a chemical into the soil, nitrogen, release nitrogen into the soil, which is beneficial for the growth of many other plants. So having pea family members, um, the release of nitrogen doesn't just benefit those plants, but other plants that require the nitrogen that they release. Um, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, plants also share resources, share food with other nearby plants. Um, they favor their relatives. They're actually smart enough to be able to favor their relatives um, if it's uh, a plant that has, is one of their offspring. But they will share resources with other nearby plants as well. Um, they're sharing their food through the root system and through the fungi that they partner with with other nearby species. And this is an area that I think that we're, you know, we know a little bit about, but there's so much more we could know. You know, for example, is it just the, uh, in a given habitat where plants have evolved to be successful, say in a woodland um, in the Sourlands, what plants really rely on the presence of other plants for the nutrients that they share. And this is something that we don't really know that much about yet, but it'd be pretty interesting to uh, do more research. Um, the other thing that they share, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, is signals of, of stress or chemical signals of distress. Um, and again, they can, they can pass that in a couple of different ways. One is through their root system, again, with the assistance typically of mycorrhizal fungi, fungi under the soil. Um, they can also send those signals as um, chemicals that are released into the air, into the atmosphere around them. So those are two mechanisms that they have of letting their neighbors know that there is a potential threat nearby. Um, typically plants or many plants have the ability to, plants are um, 
they have a love-hate relationship with animals and they're always trying to attract certain animals to help them with things like pollination and seed dispersal. But on the other hand, um, those of us who live in the sourlands know well that um, there are animals that may eat the plants and plants have um, strategies. They've evolved various types of strategies to uh, help to protect themselves from being eaten. Some of those strategies are chemical strategies that make the plant distasteful to, um, to an herbivore who would want to eat them. And they may have the ability to increase their production of that chemical when they understand that they're being eaten, that someone is starting to eat them. And they may be able to notify their neighbors, hey, you guys better ramp up before they get to you. So it's a, kind of an interesting cooperative event. People, plants and animals, plants and animals, and you know, we always think we're the most important animal. I don't know, we certainly make the most impact. So let's look at people first. Um, plants, we rely on plants for food. We rely on plants for medicine, more than we even realize, for building materials. Um, just had some of our siding replaced. It's cedar, it's wood building material. So we, re we rely on plants for our homes, for tools, for furniture. We rely on plants for many things. Um, they provide materials that we can use to make clothing. They are the source of fossil fuel and uh, some other fuels. And they're also the source of inspiration. So they really, uh, we really depend on plants in so many ways. So for food, many of us uh, will eat plants directly. People who are vegetarian, um, or vegan rely on plants as their sole source of food. Those of us who are um, who eat meat as well as uh, plants, the meat that we eat had to the animals had to have some plants. So directly or in indirectly. We rely on plants for medicine. Uh, probably one of the most famous is the wonder drug aspirin. Uh, that has been sourced from plants initially. Um, willows are one of the sources of a chemical called salicin, or which produces salicylic acid, which is the basis for aspirin. There are other plants that produce it as well. Plants produce these chemicals, interesting enough, um, to help protect themselves from some of the same threats that we have. And fortunately, we're able in some cases, sometimes those same chemicals will work effectively in human bodies or other animal bodies. And in some cases, we've been able to figure out what chemical compounds that plants contain that, we're, that are of um, medicinal benefit to us. And in fact, at least 25% of prediction drug, prescription drugs uh, contain compounds that are derived from plants. In some cases, it's directly from a plant. In some cases, it's something that was synthesized to um, mimic what a plant produces naturally. Many indigenous populations have relied on traditional medicine that uses plant sources as medicines. And there's a whole field of study called ethnobotany that now is, is um, being used to evaluate, to look at some of those traditional solutions to see if they can be incorporated more broadly in the populations, because some of them are quite successful. Um, and the traditional medicines are actually still being used in about 80% of the world's population. Those are traditional medicines that have been passed on by indigenous peoples for centuries. So we rely on plants for medicine. Um, the wild yams, this is a species that we can see in many natural areas. Um, Laura, you mentioned that um, you're going to be going to Bones Hill Wildflower Preserve soon. You can keep an eye out for this plant. Um, people that go to um, the uh, Abbott Marshlands, it's a very common plant um, on the island in um, uh, the Abbott Marshland as well. The wild yams, the, the plants in this genus, are the source of all of our steroid medicines. So including medicines that are used to uh, assist in our reproductive systems. So birth control, uh, a component of that is um, from this. 
The 2015 Nobel Prize for Medicine was awarded to someone who used common word wormwood, um, extracts from common wormwood as a treatment for malaria. And studies, many studies now show that spending time in nature has health benefits, many health benefits. I know anytime I'm all wound up, so I have to confess. So right outside my window is that little grove of uh, trees that I showed you. That's grown a lot over the years and many of them are, alas, ash trees. And outside my window today, some of them were being cut down and I had to get out of here and go someplace where ash trees were not being cut down. So we went for a walk um, at Bowen's Hill Wildflower Preserve actually, but any other trail on the Sourlands would do too. And I was a little tense when I left the house and um, going for a walk in nature really helped. So you experience those benefits directly and you recognize it. Um, going for a walk in nature or just sitting quietly in nature can help reduce your blood pressure. Um, it helps your mental health. Um, interestingly, it's not necessarily just seeing what's there, but there are multiple components to why you feel good or why it makes you feel better to be in nature. And just think about it. So we know that when we inhale, we inhale the oxygen that plants have been producing. So plants through photosynthesis, they emit oxygen. We know that plants may also into the atmosphere other chemicals. Um, maybe they're chemicals to attract pollinators. Maybe they're chemicals to, um, to uh, sort of war, ward away the threats to themselves, bacteria or viruses. Um, maybe they're uh, other kinds of threats to them. So we know that plants are producing chemicals that they release into the atmosphere. We know we're inhaling oxygen. Do you think that we could be inhaling something else, some of those other chemicals that plants are producing? Just think about walking through a pine grove, a pine forest, especially on a warm summer day, and that wonderful pine smell that you have, that you, you experience. That, those chemicals, you're experiencing not just a scent, but a scent caused by um, chemicals in the atmosphere, referred to as volatile green um, chemicals. And for pine trees, they're thought to um, exude chemicals that are antibacterial uh, and antiviral. So they can, and they're doing it to protect themselves, but we can benefit from that as well. Um, birch trees are thought to produce chemicals that um, are helpful in healing people who have um, prostate cancer or urinary tract issues. Um, the scent of the flowers of cucumber magnolia are thought to have sort of a tranquilizing effect on people. So we're ingesting not just oxygen when we inhale, but we're potentially ingesting other um, green leaf volatiles, other chemical compounds that the plant has produced for their own purposes, but that we can also benefit from. So I think that's a pretty interesting, pretty cool thing. So forest bathing takes advantage of these things as well. So just seeing nature helps to relax you, but there's so many other elements to that that um, helps to make you healthy. Plants also are pretty smart, really, and they can inspire inspiration. Um, this, you, you may or may not be familiar with, is common burdock. The um, fruit capsules that are produced after the flowers are pollinated are little burrs that you may have caught on your clothing as you've gone for a walk in the woods. There was one day I specifically went out looking for those little burrs because I wanted to take a picture to include in a presentation. And I looked and I looked, I went to a place where I knew that I had seen common burdock and I was like, I can't find it, it's not here. When I got back to the car, I saw that some of the little burrs were clinging to my shoes and socks. So the plant found me. So but that technique, that little, um, those little uh, burrs with the little teeny hooks, they were the inspiration for Velcro. And some of you may also uh, know of other plants that use a similar technique that you've come home wearing their seeds. You're helping to disperse their seeds after a walk. Okay, now we'll talk about some other animals. And here I wanna emphasize the fact that 
Um, Laura, you were telling me right before the presentation began that once you began to use native plants in your yard and garden and your property, you started to see so many more animals, so many more visitors, um, lots of Presumably you'll see lots of pollinators, you'll see caterpillars, you'll see more birds. Why? Because the plants that they evolved with are present in your yard, in your garden. Without those plants, the animals can't survive. Humans as a species are far more adaptable than most other animal species. And so, you know, we have an advantage. Um, I grew up in the Midwest. I live now about 800 miles away from where I grew up, but I was able to adapt to the climate, to the food. You know, there was nothing too weird about it here. I was able to survive and in fact thrive here. Most animals can't do that. They have to, um, they can only live where they have the support system that they evolved with. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. And this, some of you may recognize this, this is a black swallowtail caterpillar munching on water hemlock actually but so let's talk a little bit about the relationship between plants and animals um, plants depend on animals for assistance in pollination and reproduction and in fact plants um, they sort of recruit them to help they plants recruit animals to help them with pollination and with with ultimately as a result, their reproduction. Like this little uh, bumblebee here visiting, this is a wing stem flower. And you can see that the bumblebee is kind of covered with the dust of the pollen of this flower. So with any luck, she'll fly on to another wing stem flower and help with cross pollination, which ultimately helps the plant to reproduce. It's the only way the plant's going to be able to reproduce. And by the way, any plant that has bright showy flowers has specifically evolved to attract animals to come to those flowers to visit, not just to feed the, the insect, but to take the pollen, to become a pollen courier, a pollen carrier, to take pollen to another plant to help it with uh, cross-pollination. Um, plants that have inconspicuous flowers are wind-pollinated, and those are the ones more likely to cause allergies. Plants also depend on and recruit animals for seed dispersal. Here's a yellow rumped warbler. This is in the fall. And the warbler is here by poison ivy fruit. And so we don't, as people, we're not usually that excited about mingling with poison ivy, but most other animals don't seem to have a problem with the, uh, the rash reaction that we have. And in fact, birds, many bird species, love the fruit of poison ivy. Um, so Poison ivy is just one of many plant species that produce fleshy fruits that have evolved to attract animals, often birds, it could be small mammals or larger mammals, to come and eat that fruit. The fleshy fruit is there to entice the seed disperser. The seed also goes through the digestive system of the critter that consume this, the uh, fruit, and the seed is dispersed. A little bit further away from the plant. So, and often these seeds will be prepared properly and dispersed and deposited with uh, fertilizer from the digestive system of the critter that consumed the fruit. So, plants need animals for seed dispersal. They specifically recruit them to help with seed dispersal. Animals depend on plants um, for food and for shelter. So, the reason the animals that we just saw were helping the plants was because they were paid off for it. That bumblebee got nectar and pollen that she could eat herself and and or bring back to feed her kids. Um, the the uh, got the fruit to eat and was as a result was able to disperse the seeds. But so animals depend on plants for that food and also for shelter, like the white-tailed deer that we see here and so many of us see. Um, the most famous, the most well-known dependency or partnership um, between plants and animals currently is that between monarch butterflies and milkweeds. Not everyone, however, is aware of the fact that while monarch butterflies may drink nectar from milkweed flowers, 
This monarch butterflies really drink nectar from a lot of different flowers. It's not the adult butterfly itself that has to depend on um, milkweeds for food. It's actually their kids. Um, not unlike people, uh, the kids of animals, especially insects, often have a different diet, a completely different diet than their adult, the adult of the species. It's the caterpillars that require um, the food, the, the milkweed leaves as their only food that they've um, evolved to be able to consume. And this seems like kind of a risk actually, like why would monarchs do that? Um, well, you know, what happens if something happens to milkweed and they've got nothing to eat? They've, if monarchs have evolved to do that, to specialize on milkweed because milkweeds have toxins that they produce to protect themselves from being eaten by most critters. So again, plants are producing chemicals to protect themselves. In some cases, animals, whether it's people or whether it's a monarch butterfly, can figure out how to use that chemical to their own advantage. And monarch butterfly caterpillars are able to, with some difficulty, it's not that easy, but they're able to um, eat the leaves of milkweeds and sequester that harmful chemical, that toxic chemical in their bodies, which confers to the caterpillars and the butterflies ultimately, that same level of protection. So um, does, there's a risk reward here. The monarchs have evolved to take the risk of specializing on milkweeds in order to have the reward of the chemical protection that it provides. And it's a, it's a pretty uh, successful protection. I will also just have to tell you this. So the chemicals, um, the sap in milkweed leaves is latex and can tend to kind of glue your mouth parts together if you have to be munching on it. Plus the sap is where the um, concentration of the harmful chemicals, the toxic chemicals does. So many or a few insect species that have figured this out have evolved to um, minimize the flow of that, that um, sap. So the caterpillars first actually gnaw through the midrib of the leaf, which prevents or it minimizes the amount of that sap that will fly, flow through the rest of the leaf, which makes it easier for the caterpillar to consume it and uh, tolerate it. So anyway. However, they're not the only ones. Monarchs are not the only ones that benefit from milkweeds. The flowers produce nectar that are a banquet for all kinds of butterflies, all kinds of bees, um, as well as wasps and other critters. It also provides sort of a hunting ground for predators. I don't know how well you can see it, but right down here is an assassin bug that blends in perfectly with the flowers of the swamp milkweed here. So um, they, the milkweed flowers provide lots of food, they provide habitat and a place, to, uh, a place to actually eat or a place to shop, a place to hunt. Um, those flowers may be visited by, um, this is actually a snow very clear wing moth, it looks like sort of a cross between a hummingbird and a bumblebee, it has a very long um, tongue or mouth part proboscis that it uses to drink the nectar from the flowers. And this is another moth species whose caterpillars have also evolved to be able to eat the leaves of milkweeds. And notice they're very carefully eating just along um, one side of the leaf, carefully avoiding the midrib, which may have more of the, the chemical in it. Um, now, some of you may notice that there is another critter here uh, that's taking advantage of the milkweed, the swamp milkweed over here on the left-hand side. It's an aphid, and I know some of you are going, ew, aphids, I hate them. Well, you know, everybody's got their pluses and minuses. No one is all good or all bad. And while this particular aphid species is actually not native, it typically does not really, it doesn't kill the plant, um, lose some of the resources of the plant. It will take some of the food, it will share the plant's food. It's tapping into the stem of the plant to um, eat some of its food, uh, but the aphid actually is a, a sustainable source of food for ants. If you can see it, there are ants here that are um, sort of milking the aphids for the sweet honeydew that they produce, their excrement, as a result of eating the milkweed, um, eating from milkweeds. 
And the aphids can also be uh, a less sustainable source of food for, we're actually seeing this poor little aphid being eaten by two critters at once. This larger critter here that's biting the aphid in the butt is a lady beetle larva who is about to eat it. But meanwhile, there's also this little bubble-like thing which on um, the aphid's butt, which it's actually the aphid abdomen, but um, that is a braconid, a sign of a braconid wasp who is eating the aphid from the inside out. So it's an unsustainable, I mean, it provides food for many critters. The other interesting thing about the presence of these aphids on the milkweed is that it actually triggers the milkweed to sort of um, change up the um, composition of the chemicals that it's producing to protect itself. And those chemicals end up being um, beneficial to monarch butterfly caterpillars. It actually seems, the monarch butterfly caterpillars seem to do better, thrive better when those aphids are present. Not that they don't do okay anyway, but it, it seems to help them oddly enough. Um, however, if the ants are present, that might be less beneficial because ants like to eat caterpillars. So um, there you have it, which is actually another reason by the, that the presence of these aphids isn't that bad. The presence of the ants that are milking the aphids will um, help to uh, uh, protect, potentially help to protect the plant. Um, there are other have seen that also use milkweeds. The red milkweed beetle and the small and large milkweed bugs also use milkweeds. These bugs typically um, are more interested in the seeds than anything else. Milkweeds also are, um, they provide uh, material for bird nesting. Both the yellow warbler and the Baltimore Oriole use the fibers inside milkweed stems to help build their nests, which you may be able to see here. Um, the, the fluffy pappus that's attached to the seeds has actually been used to um, stuff life vests in World War II, and it's so buoyant um, that it was a really successful use of that plant. It's now being used commercially. There's a company in uh, Canada that I think is farming milkweeds in Vermont and using the, uh, this fluff to stuff things like mittens and vests for winter clothing. Um, another really interesting plant to me, one of my personal favorites, just because it has so many stories to tell, is wild senna. Um, this plant actually is another source of medicine for people, and that medicine helps to make it deer resistant. This is what it looks like when it's in bloom, and you may be able to tell from the photo on the right, which is what it's like in fruit, that it's a member of the pea family. But wild senna, does senna cot ring any bells with anybody? Senna is actually a source of laxatives, and that is a chemical that the plant produces to protect itself from being eaten by herbivores, critters who would like to eat its leaves. However, it's also something that people can use to benefit themselves as well. Um, another interesting thing about the flowers of wild senna is that they produce nectar. They only produce pollen, and they actually have two different types of um, anthers. The anthers are the part of a flower that produces pollen. The, there are anthers right in the center of the flower that are actually sterile. The, the pollen is not capable of use for reproduction. It's there as a food source to entice critters like basically bumblebees to come visit and feed while the two, um, while the lower anthers shake out on to the lord of the bee, pollen that the bee will ultimately take somewhere else. So that's kind of cool. Now, not this, um, the pollen from the fertile anthers, which are the lower anthers, is released through a process called buzz pollination, which means that the bee is able to vibrate its wing muscles without actually moving its wings, setting up just enough of a vibration to shake out the pollen sort of like a salt shaker or with your dusting powdered sugar, that kind of thing, um, onto the body of the bee. And it's not every bee that has the ability to do that. It's like, for example, honeybees do not, but bumblebees and some of our other, other native bees do. So wild senna needs our native bees. We, at least sometimes, need the chemicals in wild senna to help us. So we're all related, we all need each other. 
Now I said that those flowers don't have nectar, don't contain nectar. Just the pollen is enough to attract the bees because bees eat pollen. It's an important source of food for them. But this flower, this plant has um, what are called extra floral nectaries. Just where the leaf um, meets the stem of the plant, there are these little bumps that are nectaries. They're actually producing nectar that are appealing to a number of different insects. All of the insects that we see drinking here are potentially predators of the caterpillars that might be trying to feed on wild senna. So this is, um, it's like the plant has a way of recruiting a mercenary army to protect itself. And if you don't believe me, ants do like to eat caterpillars. So having the ants around as well as the other critters are, uh, is beneficial to the plants. Another interesting thing that I find about wild senna is that it is a food plant for the caterpillars of some butterflies. Um, the cloudless sulfur is one that we more frequently see here. The sleepy orange is one that we're only in the last few years beginning to see more frequently. This is a butterfly that is um, more of a southern butterfly. It was, pre it was not previously thought to be able to survive winters further north than North Carolina. But I started seeing it at Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve, where we have a lot of wild senna. Um, and I think it was 2006. And I see it there most years, not every single year, but most years. So we think that it's beginning to be able to um, survive the winters here. And it's becoming more common in some of the butterfly counts, the July, for the July butterfly count. I think it's been seen at uh, the pole farm at Duke Farms, so it's being seen more frequently. There are some people I know even further north in New Jersey that have been seeing it in their gardens. So what enables this if, I mean, it's one thing to be able to survive a colder winter, but you can only do that if you have the food that you need. And the food plant that sleepy orange and cloudless sulfurs require is wild senna. And it has a far enough range, the range of wild senna goes far enough north to enable the sleepy orange and the cloudless sulfur to extend their ranges further north if they can just figure out how to survive the cold or if, as what is happening now, the climate changes such that the winters are more tolerable for them, period. So wild senna can help enable these critters to extend their territory in these days of climate change. And some of those caterpillars will end up being protein for birds, so many benefit from this. Um, the spent herbaceous, the spent stems of herbaceous plants are beneficial, even after the plant is through blooming and through producing fruit, it still provides benefits. Uh, those plants could be winter shelters for insects. Um, they are the they're providing food for insects or small birds and they may be offering ne uh, nesting materials for next year. So don't be quick to clean up your garden. If you had that on your to-do list, you can just take it off. Blueberries um, for people and poll pollinators. They require buzz pollination. So while honeybees may be able to pollinate them, they don't do it as efficiently as many of our native bees, um, like bumblebees and the mining bee that we see here. And it's not just blueberries that are most efficiently pollinated by through buzz pollination, but cranberries, tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, all of those are buzz pollinated. Um, and there are some species of plants where there are pollinators that specialize on those plants only. They're particularly efficient in uh, their visits to those flowers. So if the flowers are pollinated, the fruit is produced that we all love. And so not only people love it, but so do small mammals like chipmunks and box turtles even, believe it or not, as well as the many bird species that love to eat those blueberries. Um, blueberries, the, the plants in this genus are actually the um, potential host plant for up to 300 species of butterfly and moth caterpillars. So they're very hospitable to lots of different critters, including the saddleback that we see here and the spring azure butterfly. Another interesting plant, I kind of like to do underdogs sometimes. Um, many people see black walnuts and go, ooh, it's a messy plant, I hate that plant. Well, it's a really valuable plant. Um, the nuts themselves, if you consume them, are really 
uh, beneficial to your health, to brain development. I don't know about the rest of you, but you know, as your brain ages, you can use all the help you can get. So it's beneficial in preserving the brain cells that you still have. It also has nutrients that help prevent, prevent disease like diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. Um, the protein content is very dense. It's uh, it as much protein from walnuts as you do from an equal weight of beet, uh, beef. Rather. Um, there are chemicals in black walnut that help remove carcinogenic chemicals from the atmosphere. That's got to be helpful for us. And something a little bit more mundane, you can use the hulls to make a dye, and the wood, of course, is used to make furniture. Lots of benefits. Um, the nuts are also eaten by many animals, including small mammals like squirrel can end up being food for larger predators like this fox that was in my backyard a bit ago um, or red-tailed hawk. Black walnuts also supports over 100 species of butterfly and moth caterpillars which of course some of which will end up being protein for birds, food for birds. Black cherry, uh, another really great tree, uh, food for pollinators in the spring, typically May, but it also supports over 300 species of butterfly and moth caterpillars, including the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail and the Red Spotted Purple. Um, there are other insects that also use um, black cherry as their food source, including a midge that produces these finger galls in the spring. And as much as the fruit is beneficial and desirable to lots of uh, critters, including birds and other animals, I love the fact that this song sparrow is sitting surrounded by ripening fruit, but what does she in her mouth? By a caterpillar. So both are important sources of food for birds. Black cherry is also used by us for furniture and other uh, building purposes. It is, uh, used for a cough medicine and can be used as a flavoring in many cases. Oaks are, you can't say enough about the product, productivity of oaks. They support over 500 species of butterflies and moths um, as caterpillar food and hundreds of other insects. Galls are, I mean, sorry, oaks are kind of known for their galls and a gall is a plant's reaction to being used typically as a source of food and shelter by some other um, organism, often an insect. Um, so it's just, they're really productive. Many of those insects are predators for other insects, so it's like a whole big food web thing going on. They produce acorns that are eaten by lots of animals, squirrels, um, raccoons. Um, they partner with um, Fungi, the oyster mushroom is one that's uh, known to associate with oaks. And um, even birds may eat some of the acorns like the nuthatch here. This is one of my personal favorite uh, galls currently because it looks like a red Hershey's kiss and I'm into food. But um, there is uh, a wasp that's developing inside this gall, which was produced as a result of the wasp egg being laid there and the wasp developing there. The gall actually oozes little droplets of nectar, which causes ants to come and drink the nectar. And I'm really not certain whether it's benefiting the insect inside the gall or whether the presence of the ants is benefiting the, um, the oak tree from, from caterpillars that may be eating there. So I'm, I'm thinking it probably helps to protect the oak tree from the caterpillars. And all those caterpillars, food for birds. Even in death, <laughs> plants are beneficial. I mentioned before that even herbaceous plants are beneficial um, in the season after they are finished doing their alive above ground thing. Dead wood also is, is dead trees are also hugely beneficial. They um, are often uh, a substrate on which Fungi may grow. Some of the fungi may be food. Many of you may recognize this one. This is chicken of the woods, which is an edible fungi. Uh, this is probably less commonly known. It had come, has many different names. Possibly the most recognizable is reishi. And this is used in traditional Chinese medicine. 
um, it's thought to be an immune, a, a stimulant to the immune system, and it also helps to inhibit tumor growth, so beneficial to people. Um, dead wood can be a nesting site for insects, carpenter ants, uh, sweat bees. There's some species of sweat bees that nest in dead wood. Uh, some of the wasps do, putter wasps as well. And some of those insects are food for birds. The pileated woodpeckers, for example, are quite fond of carpenter ants and emerald ash borers. If only they were quick enough to get more of them before they killed the trees. The dead wood also provides nesting sites for birds like this pileated woodpecker and Carolina chickadees are among the many. Um, dead wood can be nesting sites for small mammals and those small mammals might become lunch for a larger mammal. Dead wood can also be uh, a nesting site for a large predator and like this great horned owl. Even the forest floor is beneficial. The leaves there are the best mulch that you can have for your plants and they are free. Um, they're also uh, a source of shelter for lots of insects that are spending the winter in or below the leaf, the fallen leaves. Some of those insects will end up being food for other critters during the winter, like birds. If you've ever seen birds out tossing the leaves over, they're looking for maybe seeds, but they're really happy to find an insect to eat too. So why are plants important to all life, and in particular plants that are native to the area where they evolved? Because of all the things that they do for us, starting with producing oxygen, which is absolutely the basic element that we all need. Um, they help with um, stormwater management in many ways. They provide food and habitat for all animals, including people. So that's who needs plants, pretty much everybody. These are some of the resources that I used in putting this together. I'll leave that up for a minute. And if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to take them. So if anyone has a question, could you type your name into the chat box? And while you're doing that, I'll just say a couple of uh, uh, more things about the Sauerland Conservancy. That was, uh, Marianne is one of our, our uh, regular and very valuable and popular speakers. That was an amazing amount of information. And I've taken some notes of some plants I want to get. Um, thank you all for participating tonight. Uh, normally, we'd be in person at the Hopewell train station, but in this time of COVID, this Zoom format allows us to uh, continue to engage with you and provide these fabulous programs. Um, so please check our website, sourland.org, for the rest of the speakers and dates in this, in this series. And uh, we hope you'll join us again, and please know that we appreciate your support. Well, any questions, anybody? If not, thank you all for coming and um, thanks for inviting me. Thank you so thank much. You. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.